Hello and welcome to Save Your Sanity, Help for Toxic Relationships. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler and I'm glad you're here. There's so much to know when you find yourself with a relentlessly difficult person. And that's why I created the term hijackles. So we could talk about these relentlessly difficult people without pretending to be able to make a diagnosis. And so when we talk about hijackals, we can talk about the patterns, the traits, the cycles that they have without talking about some kind of psychological diagnosis. So tonight we're going to talk about how to read narcissistic hijackals, smiles and smirks. And it's important to be able to do that because you need the understanding so that you can allow some of the mechanisms you were born with to work on your behalf. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And if you want to know more about the work at any time, you can certainly learn more. Just go to emergingempowered.com emergingempowered.com and you will find me there and um, it used to be called for relationship help and you can get there that way as well but now we have moved all the information to emergingempowered.com so come on over over there there's so much information free checklists um, my membership program, Emerging Empowered. There are blogs, there are videos, there are hundreds of pages of information. So I'm glad you're here so you could hear about that so that when we're not together, you can go and find all of that valuable information that you need. Because sometimes you start second guessing yourself and questioning your sanity uh, when you're with a hijackal. And so listening to this material or reading the material, wow, it's not me, it's them. Here's my part in it. Here's their part in it. Let me understand that completely. So as we talk tonight about these narcissistic hijackals, and all hijackals are narcissistic, no matter uh what sort they are, and there are many sorts. My definition of hijackals, and those of you who have been with me for a while know, hijackals are people who hijack relationships for their own needs and purposes, and then relentlessly, <coughs> they relentlessly scavenge them for power, status, and control. So they're always on the lookout for being better than you, more than you, certainly above you in every way, and they will scavenge things from you. So, of course, when they are <clears throat> dealing with um, ways to have power over you, they have developed power over you in subtle ways. And I spoke in the last episode about the five cranial nerves that are always taking in information from the moment that you're born, and you can rely on those. You can rely on them. But the issue is that as we, we learn things, we have experiences, we experience our parents, we experience the world, we go to school, we have an association with other adults beyond our parents, and we start to think, oh, well, I should do it that way, or I'm going to make exceptions for people. These are all good pieces of learning, but because this information that we take in through these cranial nerves that are there long before we have language are very, very rich. As we begin to learn things, we start to override the information that our body is actually taking in automatically. And then it's responding to that information while we're trying to run a different kind of information through our head. So that may sound like my definition of enabling. You're feeling all this from the hijackal. Things are not feeling right. They're not feeling fair. They're not feeling equal. They don't feel reciprocal. And yet your brain is making up excuses, which sounds like my definition of enabling, which is when you frequently or usually step in to fix, solve, justify, rationalize, or make the consequences go away for the poor choices of another human. 
So the brain engages and we forget that the body got all this information about, mm, that's not safe. I don't like that. Ooh, walk away. And we're overriding it with the, the shoulds and, and things that I've talked about in other episodes. So this is all beginning to be cumulative, the things that I'm talking about in these recent episodes that are linked together. So <clears throat> when we're getting this information from our cranial nerves, which are not speaking from our worldly experience, they're speaking from our body sense, from our vagus nerve mostly, it can be very confusing. And the more confusion we have, the less bandwidth we have to actually pay attention in the moment. And hijackles are different from healthier humans. You know, it <clears throat> what they do and why they're doing it is different than from what healthier humans do and why they're doing it. So relying on our nonverbal cues is a very important thing to do. Not override them with thought, but to actually <sighs> exhale and try and read what's your body sensing about this. Now I know sometimes you're just backed into a corner, you don't have that kind of time. But right now, even when that hijackal is not there, just allow yourself to slow down and say, what's my body sense of this? Because we spend about three years without anything but naming language. And we took in so much information about how we're safe, how we're not safe, whether it's safe to connect to this person or whether we need to protect from this person. And our body is taking all that in, is taking it in from the facial gestures, the tone of voice, the way they are in space, the look in their eyes, the movement of their head, all things that I spoke about in the episode on the narcissist's voice. So this is something we need to know further because their smiles and their smirks are definitely connected to the way that they are thinking about us and the way they are likely to treat us. So we have become very good at picking up these nonverbal cues, but depending on the home that you were born into, you may not be as skilled at not feeling that all of that is your fault. <laughs> and of course, a hijackal is going to tell you everything is your fault. So that's no surprise. So we begin to try and please the hijackal as though they are a healthier human who will also endeavor to please you back. But that's not going to happen. So I was thinking today about mask wearing. What has this done to little children who are under the age of three and have spent most of their time in, a, in places where people have masks? It is very confusing to not be able to read the whole face. Maybe you found it confusing too. You go to the grocery store and you're not sure if the people are smiling. Maybe they are. Um, maybe they're not. Maybe they're tired. You, you can't tell when you have a half a face. Well, you can't tell nearly as well as when you have a whole face to look at. And so just in the experience of mask wearing, you can think of that. How are you knowing what other people are thinking and feeling when you can't see their whole face? <laughs> How does that work? And are they friendly or are they concerning? Well, you need a lot of information. And if some of it is blocked out, you're going to have trouble with that because you only have partial signals to go on. Now, when you're with a hijackal, you have all the signals, unfortunately. But it can be useful once you realize what you're looking for, what you're listening for, what are these signals all about. And <clears throat> when people are wearing a mask, you can't tell if they're smiling or smirking. That's troublesome right there. But there are other cues. You know, the tone of voice, the intensity of the voice, the volume of the voice, the pace of the voice. Babies pick that up. They know, is it safe? Is it not safe? Is that person happy? 
How close is that person? Is that person coming toward me or going away? All of that is being picked up in the tone of voice. And then, as I said in the episode on the narcissist's voice, there's a big clue as to how still somebody holds their head when they talk to you. If they want to really drill down into you, they hold their head still and super focus their eyes. What does a baby pick up from that? They don't have the experience that we as adults have. What are they picking up from that? And of course, they're learning. How do I stay safe in the world? Is this person going to keep me safe? If they're not, how do I placate them? How do I get away from them? What do I do? And what happened to you when you were a child? Were you in a safe place? Were you in a home where you felt safe all the time emotionally? Or most of the time, except when you did something you knew very well you ought not to have done? Was it generally a safe place where you could connect with other humans and they wanted to connect with you? Because that's what goes sideways with hijackals. They want to connect with you till they get you hooked and then they don't want to connect with you anymore. They just want to use you. And every time they think they're going to lose you, then they pretend like they want to connect with you for a little bit of time, a hot minute or two. And then when they think they've got that nailed down and secure, then they go back to being dismissive and devaluing. And we've talked about that cycle frequently. So <clears throat> our eyes watch for cues of safety and uh, cues that somebody is someone we could connect with safely. But our eyes also watch for people that we should be wary of. And all this is happening before we're even three years old. But if we've been overridden by parental information and all the shoulds in life and all of that, we don't listen to those basic things sometimes. And when they come up, we engage our brain. And what do they need? What do they want? If I give them more of what they want, will they be happy? Oh, they're still not happy. I'll give them more. Pretty soon you'll be a pretzel and or a doormat and they still won't be happy. I'm sure you've experienced that if you've had a hijackle in your life, right? You just can't make them happy because as soon as you make them happy, it seems like equality to them and they're not having that. So now something's off and they need something else in order to be happy. And sound is a strong trigger of safety for us. As I said, the sound of the voice, but you know, in the work on polyvagal theory that I explored a couple of times in episodes, the work of Stephen Porges and Deb Dana and they talk about prosody, which is the music of the voice. Prosody, P-R-O-S-O-D-Y. And that sound of the voice is more than the words. It's patterns and rhythms and, and again, intensity and pace and volume and the melody of the voice. So how do you tell between a voice that is safe and a voice that is dangerous? Well, each one of you know how to tell if it seems dangerous or if it seems inviting. But when you couple that voice with the look on the face, then we get way more cues and clues. And that's what we still need when we're in relationship with a hijackal, whether that's a parent or a sibling or a partner or even someone at work or in the community or at church. We need to understand that we need to pick up all the cues and trust ourselves to pick them up. Maybe even make a list of what's going on. And we need to calibrate that. Because what you heard and understood as a child connects to what you hear in another person's speech. You're, you're comparing and contrasting. Was I safe? What did that look on the face mean and it's so deep inside you but a hijackal wants to just get you on the run backing up all the time so you may not take that exhalation and say what am i reading here what am i truly reading because you will override the information that your body is rightly taking in with the shoulds that people have given you. Now, you know I'm on a mission in life to eradicate the word should because that is directional and it is uh, parental. And 
I really invite you every time you're about to say the word should to replace it with the word could to give it options. Lots and lots of options. Hijack calls won't give you options. They will tell you the shoulds, my way or the highway. But when you're talking to yourself, talk in options. So perhaps take it to heart and shift any shoulds to coulds. That could really help you. So let's talk about smiles and smirks. Because there is a big difference between a genuine smile and a social smile. A genuine smile is someone is they can hardly help themselves from doing it. They automatically light up when you come in the room or they, they meet your eyes. You know, it happens just walking down the street with people you don't even know, let alone the closeness that we may have with parents or siblings or partners. And that genuine smile is, is easy to detect because your eyes close a little bit and your cheeks move up and that makes your eyes crinkle at the corners and you just get that brighter feeling from the smile. And it, it just feels absolutely honest. But a social smile, they don't move their upper face at all. So there's no wrinkling around the eyes, you know, like you you know, when you see somebody in court or whatever and they smile and then they don't. And you, people take pictures of that sometimes in videos because it's so obvious the person smiles when somebody looks at them, but immediately is without the smile. And that's a social smile. I, I know I'm supposed to smile right now. I don't feel like it. I don't want to. And after you've been with a hijackal for a while, you may be really good at the social smile because you found that the genuine smile, the willingness to offer that is gone. So you become good at the social smile. But for this episode, I'm inviting you to think about, am I getting a genuine smile from a hijackal? Or am I getting a social smile? They have the cue. They know they're supposed to smile. But nothing happens around the eyes. No warmth occurs. A genuine smile gives us a feeling of safety. So we want to engage. We, we want to move towards that person. But a social smile does not invite us, and it can be a big sign of danger, too. So remember those cranial nerves that are always giving us information and our willingness to override with, oh, you know, that person likes me. It, it, they feel a little prickly. They feel a little aloof. They feel a little fake, maybe. But, you know, they're smiling. No, they're not. They are giving you a social smile. It's socially appropriate to smile right now, but I feel absolutely no warmth for you. So you don't get the genuine smile. There's no feeling in their eyes. And if you notice in your body, a social smile makes you feel wary. It makes you feel like you've got to, oh, well, I, they're smiling. And you know very well it's not the right kind of smile. It's not a welcoming smile. It doesn't say, I want you. I welcome you. I find you worthy. I want to engage with you. It doesn't. And hijackals use a social smile, except when they're dating in the love bombing phase. Then they fake a genuine smile. If a person can do that, you know, they know what that looks like. Now, is this causing you to think of what happens in your relationship? I hope so. Because you can have a good look at your family photographs if you had a hijackal parent. And look at the smiles. You know, I've disclosed many parts of my life because I hope it's helpful. But I look at the photographs and I see the empty smiles of my parents, the totally social smiles that you wouldn't see any other time when they are knowing what to do to have a photograph. But they're not genuinely happy. They're not genuinely connected to people. It is just a time when someone says, smile for the camera, and they do. 
but there is no genuine happiness. There is no genuine recognition of, of connection. It just isn't there. And sometimes I'll look at photographs of people who are adults now, but we look at your younger years. What kind of smiles did you have? Were you unhappy and you smiled when someone said smile? <clears throat> I have a pet peeve. You may share that pet peeve. But <clears throat> I have many times had someone say to me, you know, in the grocery store or whatever, and it's, it's very invasive for them to do so, but they think they're being amusing. And particularly because I'm a woman, it'll come from a man. I've never had a woman say this to me. And I'll say, <clears throat> well, give me a smile. You must be happy about something. Someone trying to force me to smile at them. That is not going to have much hope of getting a genuine smile from me. Yet they think that they deserve a genuine smile from me. Now, yes, they may just think that I'm looking serious. It may be all very, very above board. But on the other hand, if I'm feeling my feelings and I am not smiling at you, Maybe it would be best to notice how I am feeling rather than to tell me I should be smiling. Have you had that experience with hijackals? They'll tell you to smile, you know, tell you to try and connect with them, and you don't feel it, and you don't feel it from them. And that's very important. <clears throat> so this, this whole mixed, mixed sensation of safety and danger, the genuine smile being safer and a desire to connect, and the social smile being more dangerous and, and creates wariness in our bodies because real light, real smiles light up your face. You can't help but do that. You know that you're genuinely happy to see someone. You're feeling genuinely happy. You appreciate things. It just happens. But social smiles are contrived. And look carefully at the hijackals in your life, or if you're away from them, think of them, and see the difference, how you can calibrate people who have genuine smiles and people who have social smiles in your life. And go toward the ones who have genuine smiles because they are giving you, I want to connect with you vibes. And the people who are giving you social smiles are giving this, I'm putting up with you smile. Hijackals often give us that sense like they may <laughs> smile. It's not a smirk, it's a smile, but it is a social smile. And <clears throat> we don't want to move toward that. This hijackal social smiles are untrustworthy. And yet we're so longing for a genuine smile from them that we almost want to take their social smile and decide it's a genuine smile because we're hungry for it. It feels like approval. It feels like an invitation to closeness. It feels like I could trust that person and that they are legitimately in relationship with me in a positive way. But I'm sure you know instances in your life where those smiles had nothing to do with inviting connection. In fact, sometimes those smiles are inviting cruelty. And that actually occurs. You know, I did a, I did a podcast, um, I think it's number 142, although I can't be sure, but around there with Dan Hill, who was a facial decoder, and we talked about the hijackal smirk, and I did an episode on that. Well, I, we talked about it in that episode. And <clears throat> you know this one-sided facial expression. I know you know it because you're here on the, on the podcast listening to this, but only one side of the face goes up, and the other side stays down, and it creates this smirk. And in facial decoding, what that smirk is, it is the, the facial sign for anger and the facial sign for disdain, and that creates the facial sign for contempt. And isn't that what you feel when they look at you like that? 
that they are being contemptuous. They are, are just wanting to, to, to put you down and look down at you. And <clears throat> there's even a name that was created for this smirk, aside from you know the hijackle smirk, and it's called duping delight. That they they have this look on their face because they duped you, they manipulated you, they coerced you, they got you to do something, they think they got you to believe something, and then they have this look on their face. Do you recognize that? That hijackal smirk is legendary, and it's a way to convey something. So I found a, a really interesting article on covert narcissism and the smirk, and I'm, I'm going to up. I'll put the link to it in the notes, but there were some thoughts that came out of that article on why hijackals smirk. And one of the reasons that they do it is that they manage to get negative supply out of you. You know, they've, they smirk because you gave them something. You supplied them with something. And now they are, ah, my calculations worked. All right. And another thing they do, that smirk is related to their deception. They're deceiving you. They're lying to you. They're stealing from you. They're gaslighting you. And they're, they're thinking that they're superior to you. And we get the smirk. Or maybe they actually think they caused you harm or damage. And that brought them pleasure. It doesn't give them a genuine smile because they seldom have one. It doesn't even qualify for a social smile, but they will give the smirk like, ah, oh, I hurt you. Ah, oh, good for me. I found a way to hurt you. And that's um, one of the reasons that they feel so good. And that's when they get the smirk. And also, have you ever noticed that they will have that smirk when you're sad? when you have been hurt or when you've had something go wrong or you need surgery or you get a cold or you can't attend something that they'd rather go to themselves, they will have that smirk when you have uh, experienced any kind of misfortune, either caused by them or caused externally, and they love that. You know, the Germans have a word for it, it's schadenfreude. And that's, you know, the dark, you know, can almost hear the, the contradiction in it. Another thing that they will do is they feel energized and happy when making you jealous. So they like to triangulate and they like to go a step further often and actually cheat on you. And so you'll get the smirk, who me? Why would I do something like that? Meanwhile, you'll see the smirk, which is a telltale sign that they're not telling you the truth. They think that they are smarter than you and they can pull this off and they will they will turn it around and blame shift onto you. Oh, you're probably having an affair. Why are you talking to me about it? You will see all of that, but you will see the smirk. And hijackals not only enjoy hurting you, but they enjoy planning how they will hurt you. And so you will see the smirk when they're doing the planning and when they actually think they're hurting you. Are these things ringing true for you? Because it pops out. They can't keep away from the smirk. You know, these are very almost autonomic things that happen. The re relationship between what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and the look on their face, just like is true for most of us. But hijackal humans have different motivation. So people who are not hijackal humans sometimes smirk because they have occasional moments when they feel, <laughs> you know, that happened to you and it didn't happen to me. So it's not unique to hijackals, but the frequency of it is unique to hijackals, you know, because it proves that they're superior to you and you are lesser than them. So the smirk is arrogance and smugness and, and that grandiosity that, that will occur. And of course, they love to gaslight you, which means they like to define your reality for you and have you believe it. So they will say things to you that will tell you how you feel or what you should remember or how 
something ran and they're very happy about that they're very happy about that because they gaslight you and then they want to force you to believe the story that they're telling you that is only for their own manipulation of the situation now that's a lot it truly is a lot because all of that is just going on between a smile and a smirk and the sound and remember that many of these things went into those five cranial nerves that are not connected to your experience and your thought and the development of your, your neocortex as you grow because our brain grows for the first 30 years of our life. No, these come fully formed in your brain at the moment you're born. And they're taking in information, taking it in, all the information, how you sit, how you look, when you move forward, when you move back, the look on your face, the sound of your voice, the raising of an eyebrow, combining all those things, the movement of your head. So that's another reason why hijackals often have a hijackal parent because they modeled that. That's what was modeled for them and they continue to model it. So these are some big things to think about, really big things to think about because when you start getting wise to that difference between a genuine smile and a social smile, mm, you look at them differently. You don't return social smiles once you cotton onto it. And then when you learn what the smirk is really about and you notice the frequency of it, you will begin to see that there are other strategies and techniques in terms of communication that you need to know in order to manage what happens before and after the smirk. So much to learn. But as you learn these things, you get more and more able to catch on to what's really happening and you can get out of that feeling of being suppressed of marginalized isolated and go oh i can read that on your face you are broadcasting to me what you're doing and when i sit back a little bit and i am not fearful and i am not concerned and i am not trying to please you and i observe the hijack call then I start to see these differences. And as I see these differences, I cannot have the wool pulled over my eyes as easily. And the hijacko begins to notice there is a change. They don't like it, but they can't do anything about it. So very important to see those differences, to realize how we were raised. If you were raised by a hijacko, all of those things were shown to you before you had words that were meaningful and imagine what needs to be uncovered in there for you to get healthy feelings, healthy perceptions, and a healthy balance in a relationship by using your brain once you've taken in all of this and given credence to what your cranial nerves are reading. So this is very important. If you'd like to work with me, you can do that by going to beaclient.com. I have a one-time, one-hour offer for new clients there at beaclient.com, only $97. And if you'd like to be part of my Emerging Empowered community, you can do that by going to joinintoday.com. Lots of things there for members, lots of perks, time with me, Lots of things to do and have and experience. Very important. And if you're just putting your toe in the water and maybe you've just found me or you didn't hear this before, I do have a weekly newsletter and you'll find it at hijackalhelp.com. And you spell hijackal, hijack, A L, just that simple, hijack, A L, help, H E L P. Dot com. You can get the newsletter full of all kinds of good things. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope it has caused you to sit back a little bit and say, oh, I'm going to observe this carefully. So until we meet again, take very, very good care of yourself because you're precious and you matter. Talk soon.
Good evening. Let's see who's here and what's happening. Okay, there we go. Lots of comments. Okay, hello, Rundell. Haven't seen you for a while. Alvina, hello. Oh, I'm glad you like the sound of my voice. Good. Nana. I haven't seen you before, so welcome, or I haven't seen you post before. She says, your podcast has helped me a lot during my separation. Thank you. You're so welcome. That's why I do it. I want to be available when you need to hear something. So I'm glad it's been helpful. Hi, Linda. Hi, Jennifer. We won't read Jennifer's comment. <laughs> um, I always find those kind of things um, a little embarrassing, but you can read it. Linda says, that tone of voice, those smirks, I'm just expending so much energy. Yes, you do, don't you? You really do. You just, you get to that place where you're like, what do you know? What are they doing? What's going to happen? How is it going to happen? What do I have to be careful? What do they want? What can I give them? What can I do for them? Oh, and your mind just gets so full and your body is on edge. So it is exhausting, Linda. You do expend so much energy. Hello, John. He says, they control with tone of voice. I never got the sexy voice that I overheard one time. And it so happened when she lost her voice. Yeah an excuse for losing her voice. Hmm. Yes. I hope soon that, that you will heal from that experience and, and have some good experiences in your life. I said it. Hi. You are my truth angel, and I have a lot of love in my heart for you. Thank you. I will have a great night. I am having a great night. I'm here with you. So that's always a good thing. Linda says, my mother was a hijackal. It's taken me 62 years to have your knowledge and realize I'm surrounded by them with a few of my friends. Yes, I've talked about that several times, Linda, on various evenings. And when you have a hijackal mother, you get kind of calibrated to that frequency. And you start realizing after you've had all this learning that you've attracted similar friends. And you put up with them for years because it was all very familiar. So it's, it, it means we need to extract ourselves and find friends who give us that energy of connection, who spend most of their time with a genuine smile, beckoning to us that I'm safe with that genuine smile. I have friends like that now, but a long time ago, when I was going through all of this, when I finally had to look at my friends, it was, oh, they have characteristics of both my mother and my father. And I complain about it, but I, I hadn't really realized which little pieces were there. It was a long, long time ago. But still, such a wonderful moment. And I'm glad that you're having it, Linda, that you realize that you have friends that are similar to the mother or father or whomever it was that was the major hijackal in our young life. And so that all went in under the radar before we knew that we needed to defend ourselves against it. John says, when they have the crow's feet wrinkles around their eyes or their cheeks, it's like scrunches their face, <laughs> a, a grin. Well, genuine smiles cause the movement of the cheeks because the cheeks move up. So it creates those wrinkles. And yes, some of us have those wrinkles all the time now. But, you know, when, when you smile, that actually happens. But when you do the smile that has that, oh, I'm smiling, are you satisfied? There's no wrinkles, there's no lift here. So it's important to see. Oh, and John says, yes, they roll their eyes as they put you down. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> so absolutely true. All right, let's see what else we have here. All right. John says, their smirks and sound make me shake and my stomach hurt. 
It causes rheumatic diseases, nerve damage. It'll cause anything that is inflammatory. It will certainly go in that direction. And in nervous situations, you know, it'll cause anxiety or greater anxiety, which can lead to digestive issues and autoimmune issues. Because the body is reading this all the time, whether or not we take it in logically into our thought process, the body is always reading it. So the body will give us those signs. So when the body starts to have issues, hear that, take care of the body, because the body will go from giving you a little, a little moment of I'm uncomfortable. And if you don't pay attention, it will continue to increase until the body is screaming at you and you can't do anything but pay attention to it. So remember with this difference between the cranial nerves and the actual centers of logic and reason and parietal and prefrontal lobes, they don't come on board until somewhere between five and seven years old. So all that stuff that's gone in there beforehand, hmm. So it's very, very important for us to, to recognize that it is connected to the body and the body will take it in and have problems. Linda said, the way they lie, causing that cognitive dissonance by telling me something one day and when it comes up a few days later, they say they didn't say it. I don't listen, it makes me crazy. Yeah, well, isn't that the case with hijackals? They... They have to win in the moment. So they say whatever they need to feel that they're winning. And then when you try to hold them to what they said, all they do is tell you that you're wrong, you don't listen, you don't have any value. And depending on what the issue is, they can get quite riled up about it, totally out of proportion to what the conversation actually was. Hello, Jennifer. I've been living with this smirk for 25 years. What does it do to you? Do you feel that coldness in your gut when you see that smirk? I know, oh, because it usually goes with really cold eyes, doesn't it? Jennifer says, yes, I've broken up with almost every old friend. It's difficult. I know it's difficult. All right. Jennifer said, I've recently figured out I have terrible choking problems when I'm eating with him. Yeah, you just don't want to swallow that stuff anymore, right? <laughs> um, sort of a metaphor in the body because I'm going to close down. I'm going to close out listening to him, and I am closing down. So it's a good metaphor. John says, their frowns are so dramatic with fake tears. Yes, if they can cry tears, but you see the number of times that happened in the Amber Heard Johnny Depp thing uh, where there was a lot of crying going on, but there were no tears, absolutely no tears because hijackles don't bother with the tears. They only do the drama and the noise. <laughs> so that becomes very important. Or as Linda says, yes, they'll say, I never said that. Oh, says, Linda Green says, long-term friends, I'm just trying to learn maybe how to keep them, even though I feel so beneath them. Yeah, well, you don't want hijackles in your life. You know, sometimes we have to keep them. We're born by them, and so we feel we have to stay or tangentially in touch. Some people are too toxic to be around, so you really do have to go no contact with them, not do any of that. It's very difficult. You know, in the membership program, I'm just writing journals now for seven areas of the relationships, and all the members have access to all seven journals when they're done. There's uh, two journals have started now. But one of the journals is, should I stay or should I go? And the next journal after that is staying for now. Because sometimes we can't get away. We have to have a plan, and sometimes it's a long-term plan. But it is important to have a plan. Jennifer, says, Jennifer Croft says, the smirk makes me sick. Um, I can't uh, render an opinion 
on Amber Heard, <laughs> I, I think I said last week why I watched quite a bit of it, is to help my clients with the legal process. So I really have been focusing on the way the lawyers structure their questioning and what they're paying attention to and how they build a case, um, because that will help me with my clients deciding about whether who's guilty i don't know not my ballywick but i can tell you that i've seen a lot of crying and i haven't seen any tears i've seen many things that fall into the categories that we talk about here but who knows that's a jury situation John says, they make me feel small and they are 20 feet tall. And they're so happy when they can do that, John. <laughs> yes, it was an interesting trial. I learned a great deal to help my clients who, who go to court and to help their attorneys build a case. Now, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, it takes 20 seconds from when you push the button to send a comment or a question until I see it. And when there haven't been any comments or questions for 30 seconds, that's my cue to say, oh, they're all filled up for tonight. They've had what they need and they're going off to think about it. <laughs> so we're getting to that point here. Linda Green said, I'm doing that, but I'm trying to be well with it. I'm getting old yet want to be happy. You deserve to be happy. You truly do. But remember, happiness is an inside job. In my opinion, it is anyway. Um, we can turn our attention to things that, that we do that we're proud of or pleased with or make us happy and engage in things that make us happy and give less and less emotional and mental bandwidth to the things that don't and the people who don't. Yes, we've got to go through the process of figuring it out. We've got to walk through all of that. And that takes time and it divides our energy and attention. And maybe we're not giving ourselves all the messages that we could. But know that you can become happier and happier as you realize that a hijackal is blaming you for the things that they know that they did. And therefore, what they're things that they say that they're directed at you are really about them. And when you can start backing away and realizing that you're really talking about yourself or you're really talking to be heard and it really doesn't have anything to do with me. That's when you begin to take up more space and be happier and breathing deeper <laughs> and feel like, ah, oh, I'm beginning to get a handle on this inequity. You know, when I talk in episode 115 about the three must-haves of a healthy adult relationship, you will never have them with a hijackal. So you can quickly find out. You can, of course, go to uh, Emerging Empowered and then see all the free checklists and take the one of, am I with a toxic person? That'll help you. But you can understand that, that this, is, this is a common thing to realize that we take on and believe what they say to us but it's really about them and we can give it back in our mind say nope not coming over here keep it over there <laughs> in our minds and allow ourselves to feel happier about that i'm discerning i know what that that um social smile means i know what that smirk means and i'm i know what to do with it and that will help you feel emerging empowered and whether you stay in the relationship or not, be emerging empowered. Turning these things around, doing some of the things that I talk about, in particular, identifying what I was talking about tonight. Krista, hello, says, my mom was cluster B. We children filled our adult lives. My sister at 27 started showing hijackal traits. Is hijackal something that is passed down? Well, it's a big issue. Um, there's certain things that they'll be able to discern now um, when they're looking at brain scans. But more likely, it is about modeling. It's all the things that we talked about tonight, that when you were preverbal, when you were a tiny baby up till the age of three, 
you are taking in all these sights and sounds and making sense of them because your one thing is wanting to survive. So you're trying to figure out how to survive, how to get those giants, those hijackal giants to keep you alive. It's as fundamental as that. And so when you're learning all of that and observing them, they're the only adults you see for a while. And then you think, oh, that's what you do. That's how you do it. And sometimes with my clients, when we go way back into those places that were pre-verbal, we find the sounds and the sights and the things that were going on that helped us know how to survive. Some of them were pretty cataclysmic and really difficult. And that's where the work lies. That's why when you go and you decide to get help, go to someone like me who has all of this extra training who knows all about these deep things i know when i was young and i wanted help nobody knew anything about what i was talking about and i have clients so many clients who say well we went to couples counseling and it didn't work the hijackal and i and i i will always ask the question did you feel as though the hijackal was manipulating the therapist to bond with the hijackal and turn the attention of two to one against you. And invariably say, yes, that's exactly what happened. So if you can't recognize the hijackal, then you can't help with that. And that makes all the difference. So, yes, it is the modeling, Krista. Linda Green says, thank you. I'm much more empowered. I'm happier, yet bewildered. <laughs> well, the hijackals love it when we're bewildered, <laughs> um, and it's not a comfortable feeling. But the more and more you learn about it, the more you realize that it has little to do with you, except that you may be enabling or putting up with it, and that you can emerge empowered. That's when the real magic happens. So I'm glad that you spent this time with me. And until we meet again, I hope you will recognize that self-care is not selfish. And take that self-care, treat yourself very well, because you're precious and you matter. And I, I look forward to seeing you again. And, and I see that Linda just slipped in another one just here. I was six, about to be seven on New Year's Day, asking my dad why my mom hates me. Yeah, see, that's the way the young mind takes this in. And it's horrible, but it's all in there. And that's why it's wise to work with someone and get it out and get you out of there so that you can fully emerge empowered into who you're supposed to be, not who they wanted to make you into. So take very good care of yourself, and we will talk soon. Bye-bye.